All right. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me the time. Just a brief uh, introduction of myself. I am the uh, CEO of, uh, of Holo and has been uh, the Holo CEO since uh, July of last year. Before that, I was the director of uh, technology and operations here. So it's a um, fairly new uh, time in, in this role for me, but uh, quite a, a couple of years in the, in the company, about three years. So uh, let's jump into it. Um, just a little brief introduction to who we are. Uh, so Holo is uh, what you could call a corporate startup. We are uh, owned by the largest car importer in Denmark that uh, imports all the brands from the Volkswagen group on the left side that you see there. Uh, founded back in 2016 when um, the similar group and a lot of others thought that uh, autonomy was going to come and disrupt the core business in, uh, in not a very long time. So uh, obviously that didn't uh, happen exactly the way that uh, everyone thought it was going to back then. But uh, still, uh, we are, uh, we're here and we're kind of the, uh, the, the part of the similar group that investigates and, uh, and keeps an eye on autonomy and, and tries different things with that and prepares for a future where autonomy is going to play some kind of role for sure. So this is what it looks like in that uh, corporate structure. We're in this uh, innovation part of the, the, um, the company. You have the mobility business on the left side which is the import and selling of cars. And we're over on the right side with two other startup companies, uh, one for fleet monitoring, one for car leasing. And then there's us as kind of the, the more radical of the three companies, the one with the, the probably the longest timeline to, uh, to, to building something that looks like a normal business, I would say. But that is accepted and understood, I think. So a little bit about the motivation behind all this. I could show a lot of different slides with the, the UN sustainability goals and, and big strategy and all these things. But uh, I find from at least my personal perspective, this is definitely the one that sums it up the best. Uh, I think uh, I'm personally driven by the enormous inefficiencies that are in the system today in the mobility system. Uh, and this was a, a, a slide I stole from someone else. Uh, I put the, the link down here at the bottom if you want to. Uh, read more about it, but uh, it, it's kind of the known number that a, a typical car is is, uh, is parked plus ninety percent of the time, and uh, even when it's uh, driving, it's not very uh, efficient in in any way. Of course, uh, that might change a little bit with electric cars, but uh, overall, uh, the, the the picture is pretty much the same. And then, of course, there is the safety and uh, it, part of all this, uh, the human errors that are created. So this is kind of the system that we want to, to do something about. This is what we want to optimize in different ways. And even just moving a lot of these different statistics by a couple of percent using autonomous vehicles uh, will have a huge effect on, uh, on the way that we uh, move, uh, the way we construct cities, uh, the way we have our, our daily lives. So that's a big motivation on, on my side, at least. Um, this is what we work with, uh, as I mentioned, autonomy in general. So uh, I put a couple of green dots here for the areas that we have worked the most with. So people transportation on the ground uh, over on the left side is green. Uh, we have uh, done projects with multiple vendors now and have quite a, quite a lot of experience there. Um, people transportation in the air is not happening anytime soon, despite what you might see about autonomous drones flying. It's not possible right now commercially uh, from a legal point of view to get things approved. Uh, operationally, uh, it's just not there yet. So we are, we're waiting for that to be a little bit more mature. We are flying drones as well, autonomous drones. So that's why freight transportation in the air is green. Uh, we have a project here in Denmark, uh, an innovation project still, but we are going to be flying uh, actual blood samples between Danish hospitals this summer. So that's really, really exciting. Uh, freight transportation on the ground is an area that got a big boost from uh, the corona crisis. I think a lot of uh, companies are looking in this direction now also because uh, the, the technology has evolved in a slightly different way than people expected. So, uh, so that's also something we're looking into in more detail now and uh, we will hopefully be able to find some, some actual projects within that uh, and, and match it up with the vendors that we are talking to within the, the next year or two. And then there's the other category, which is where it's not freight, it's not people transportation, it's something else. It's putting a sensor or a camera or something like that on an autonomous drone, uh, either in the air or on the ground. Uh, and we're also looking into a lot of different projects there without having a, a, a project that we're launching tomorrow. And then of course, uh, we want to do all this at sea as well, if we can, but uh, that's a little uh, less mature than, uh, than drones in the air and, uh, and vehicles on the ground. So this is uh, basically the whole business on one slide. So this is everything we do. Um, we don't do the autonomous software itself. That's uh, something we work with our uh, vendors to, to get. 
So uh, over in the in the left side, we start by uh, trying to find someone who has a need for autonomy or a, a wish to experiment with autonomy in some way. Uh, could be airports, could be arbors, could be municipalities, office parks, hospitals, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, and we we try to also sometimes help them uh, find the right funding uh, because a lot of these projects are uh, pre-commercial. We're not going to come and and uh, replace some of the current uh, transportation infrastructure or freight infrastructure. We need to, to train a little bit more, uh, so that's why there might be a need for some additional funding. And then down on the left side, we uh, we have a, a broad overview of the market. We keep in touch with uh, all the different uh, autonomy. Uh, vendors in different ways, the guys who build vehicles, the guys who build software, the guys who build vehicle and software, uh, and uh, and try to understand uh, what is their timeline, what is their commercial setup, uh, and how can we match that with some other routes uh, and customers and use cases that we find in the top left corner. Then if we um, if we find a match between a customer and a, and a, a vehicle, uh, we go into the middle phase here, We uh, what we call planning. We, uh, we are a big driver behind getting everything approved because that requires a lot of the local knowledge uh, in different places. So in Scandinavia, for example, we've done it uh, in Sweden, Finland, Norway, Denmark, Estonia, and, and it's a little bit different every place. It's a, it's a kind of a handheld process where you, uh, uh, you need to do a little bit, uh, things a little bit differently each time. Then we need to train our safety drivers still. Uh, we are, of course, working hard to, to get them out of the vehicles, but uh, until they're they're out, we need to have them there and they need to be trained in all kinds of ways. Then there's this risk management compliance loop at the bottom where we uh, we, we really have to, to do what we say, say we're going to do when we go driving. Uh, and we have to, if we find something out in reality that it doesn't match what we said we we're going to do in our application, we have to go back and make sure that's updated. In some countries, it's more strict than others, but uh, we are practicing also for a future where this is going to be regulated in uh, a little bit like aviation, where every single change in detail has to be documented and uh, and and kind of uh, version controlled uh, to be able to to operate safely but there's a deployment phase between planning and operations where we prepare the route uh, usually it's in, in close collaboration with the, the vehicle vendor right now they have a, a lot of responsibility because they know how their vehicle uh, performs on the route but uh, in the future we would love to take more responsibility for this because we have the local knowledge and we want to be able to to do this on a regular basis uh, as the environment around us changes. And then of course, when we go into operations, we feel operations is us having the, the guys in the vehicle. Uh, our supervision is where the action hopefully will be in the future uh, once we take the safety driver out, uh, monitoring the route uh, and everything that goes on there. And then maintenance of vehicles, uh, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and then it's a project management uh, kind of throughout all of this. So yeah, this is basically everything that, uh, that Holo does for a project. A uh, little bit more company history, uh, started back in 16, 17, started ramping up. Uh, we drove on public roads uh, the first time in the beginning of 18 in, uh, in Sweden, in Gothenburg. We've uh, had projects in uh, Norway, Estonia, Finland as well. Uh, and then finally in Denmark in 2020, even though we're a Danish company, it was the last place that we, uh, we added to the list. The legislation in Denmark is really, really complicated kind of prepared for a future where level four is kind of the standard, uh, where there, there is no safe drive in the vehicle, which presented a lot of different challenges. And the, the whole setup for the legislation in Denmark is very complex. Uh, now it's a, it's a little bit of different world after the Corona crisis, we are operating fewer vehicles and we are looking into a, a slightly different uh, strategy in, in many ways, not so much uh, ramping up all over Scandinavia, more uh, taking one step back and, uh, and diving into some of the details in our projects. So yeah, this is the, the overview of projects, all the places we've been, uh, we've been operating over on the right side, the finished projects. At the moment, we have uh, two projects in operation. We have one in uh, Olvo in Denmark with uh, Navia vehicles, and we have one in a uh, ski area in, uh, in Norway or by Oslo uh, with uh, Sensible 4 and Toyota. We'll get back to that a little bit later. And then we have one more project coming up in Denmark with Navia projects in our hospital site that was uh, unfortunately postponed due to Corona. So that uh, should have been running now, but uh, we'll be running uh, hopefully this summer. And then we have the, the health drone uh, drone flights in a, its own box there down the left corner where uh, we are test flying at the moment, but uh, working towards uh, doing actual uh, deliveries. Then uh, just to uh, a summary to say that we've done this quite a lot. <clears throat> Uh, as you can see, this hasn't been updated since January, and I've just asked for an updated version of this. Uh, uh, our uh, data specialist is working on uh, giving me uh, 
a nice new slide here, but uh, we are hoping to see this curve, of course, uh, or we are seeing this curve go go up uh, by the at the moment as well with the kilometers we're driving in our current projects. But um, of course, this is not too uh, not many kilometers compared to the absolutely market leading guys like Waymo and Cruise and all these guys. But I think for what we do in uh, in Europe and in Scandinavia, we're probably the ones who have driven. Uh, we are the ones who have driven the most kilometers by by far uh, in this regard. This is what it looks like. This was Gothenburg back in 18. This is Norhound here in uh, 2021 and 2020, as you can see from the Corona face shield up in the in the left corner. This was the harbor front in uh, in Oslo with uh, with Bruder. We're quite uh, challenging. It's in, in its own way. You can see cars, you can see bicycles, you can see pedestrians. You can see a cruise ship in the background that uh, really messes with the uh, localization of the vehicle when it's there uh, and then suddenly it's not there. Uh, that's not so easy for the mapping. So a lot of interesting operational experiences from, from projects like this. And this is from uh, from the Om Oya area and the suburb of uh, Oslo where we're driving by the water. Um, and as you can see, driving early in the morning, uh, late in the evening uh, in the snow, uh, breaking down, as you can see, you know, uh, doing maintenance on the vehicles because we're driving a lot of hours, a lot of kilometers, uh, blocking the local city bus uh, over on the left side and uh, having to talk to kids uh, about not uh, interfering with the vehicles and not playing around in it. You know, all those kilometers and all those hours gives us a lot of that uh, operational experience uh, that really, uh, yeah, uh, lets us understand what, uh, what the limitations are and what the possibilities are of these, uh, of these vehicles. So then there was a bit of a transition phase here in uh, in January. Uh, you have the uh, the Navia vehicles in the background. We have the Norwegian team uh, jumping up and down in the middle, and then we have the uh, the new vehicles uh, in our new project in the in the foreground here. And um, this is kind of a summary of that project. Uh, so this is a little bit different than what we've been used to in that uh, we have standard type of crew vehicles now, uh, Toyota Pro Ace vans that have been retrofitted by a Finnish company called Sensible Four. Uh, they pr provided the uh, the lidars and the, uh, the software, well, all the sensors basically, and retrofitted those to the vehicles and the and the software. And right now we're driving two of these vehicles uh, on a route in ski. We have uh, been test driving since January and uh, started taking passengers here in uh, I think it was the end of April. Uh, and of course there are still Corona restrictions and there are lots of uh, new challenges, but this is really exciting, uh, really big step forward for us as well. That we are now driving, uh, you know, going up to 30 kilometers an hour and and beyond, and servicing a station in the area uh, with this residential area. That is, uh, that's really really uh, interesting. So um, I unfortunately I haven't been on the route myself, which is a little bit absurd. Uh, but of course that's because of all those travel restrictions. So I'm constantly asking people for video and pictures to to get a good feel of of how it's actually going. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a really uh, exciting project for us. Just uh, one brief slide on the health drone project. As you can see on the map here in the middle, uh, we're going to be flying from a, a Danish island where there's a health uh, clinic, uh, a small hospital, to uh, a city on the mainland, and then beyond uh, that to the main hospital in a city called Odense. So we're practicing uh, all these different legs. Uh, and the next big step we're going to do is uh, from the island of Eero to Svendborg. Uh, in the next couple of weeks and we're going to be flying over uh, urban areas so we can check that off our list and once we have a, a lot of these boxes checked on our list we have a few of them already and we're missing a few once we have all those boxes checked we can start doing actual deliveries and we're working with a, a drone company called Regitech from Switzerland so we have a, a kind of a commercial vendor of a, of a drone now with all the support and uh, and everything that we need for that. So it's uh, it's starting to look like a, a real operation which is very very interesting and of course we're seeing now that we can we use a lot of the skills that we built up uh, operating autonomous vehicles on the ground. We can use that in the air and we can get inspiration from what is going on in the air back to the ground. For example, there is EU legislation for the drones in the air uh, that doesn't exist for the vehicles on the ground. And um, yeah, it's, it's just interesting to see how those uh, two areas are developing. A little bit about what that looks like. This is testing with the, the prototype before we got the full drone. Testing fail-safe systems, for example, uh, a parachute uh, coming out when uh, things go wrong. So a little bit about the, the challenges that we see as an uh, autonomous operator in, uh, in all of these different projects. I've tried to summarize it in, in some of these different boxes, and I'll try to go into the details of that in the following slides. Uh, yeah, there's some, uh, some growth, uh, and some hype uh, that we have to manage, some common uh, language that is not quite there yet, some legislation. There's frequent changes all over the place. Uh, we're living in a in a pretty new world where nothing uh, is really super mature. 
of course, some of the operational challenges that you've already seen a little bit about, the weather and all these things are uh, something that we work with on a daily basis. And then uh, just collecting all the data from the vehicles and summarizing that in different ways is something that we have be pretty much have to, to build from scratch because we don't have a, uh, a set standard. There's not uh, standard systems and, uh, and, and standard ways of, of doing all this uh, data collection uh, within autonomous vehicles yet. So a few more details about this. Um, if you, you guys know the, the Gartner hype cycle down the, the left corner, uh, this is pretty much what we've been following. Uh, so back in uh, 15, 16, uh, we were going up the hype cycle. Uh, famously, uh, Chris Urmson, one of the, uh, the, the original guys behind the, uh, the DARPA challenge of autonomous vehicles, and one of the guys who was in Google's uh, self-driving project before it was called Waymo, he said, that his, uh, I think at the time it was his eight, seven, eight year old daughter would never get a driver's license. Uh, that turned out not to be true. So she now has a driver's license. Uh, she's turned 16 in the US, she has a driver's license. So he didn't fix the problem of autonomous vehicles in time like he hoped he was going to do. So if you can see here, he, uh, the writing might be a little bit small, but autonomous vehicles down in the left corner are actually at the bottom of the trial of dissolution, which means that a lot of people have kind of given up now since it wasn't made possible within five, six, seven years from when the hype cycle started going up last time. I think people think it's impossible. It's never going to happen. Uh, so we're basically living in a world where we're now seeing us kind of coming out of this trial and we're actually seeing uh, specialized use cases in different areas where we will be possible to operate autonomous vehicles where it does make commercial sense, but it's going to take a while to to get there. Um, and, and this is kind of usually what happens with technology. A lot of people just forget that we kind of have to go through this uh, cycle sometimes. Then there's a little bit about the, the language that we use in uh, within autonomous vehicles. Um, you know, we, we don't have a, it's not a, a, an ancient industry where we have uh, tons of, uh, of, of language and, and standards for how we, we talk about this. So just as an example, recently uh, in January, Waymo uh, wrote a, a blog post where they said, we're no longer going to call it self-driving. We're going to call it autonomous driving. And um, if you if you know, they don't mention it by name, but if you know a little bit about the industry, you know that this is why, because self, of course, Tesla calls their uh, driver assistance system, they call it self-driving. And Waymo wants to distance themselves from that because it's two completely different worlds. Tesla will never be autonomous uh, in the way that Waymo is autonomous. So uh, so they have to kind of make sure that they're not too closely associated with that. Because as you can see now, uh, Tesla has lawsuits in the US and uh, if they're not careful, they might end up ruining uh, autonomous driving for everyone before we even get started. But uh, there's a bunch of other these examples of this. The, the person that we have in the vehicle, is he an operator? Is he a safety driver? Is he a steward? Um, changes over time, who knows? Um, we're definitely not using the same terminology across projects and across countries and across vendors even. Is it called a shuttle, a minibus? Is it something else? Is it a van? Is it a, yeah, I don't know. Uh, then we have all the, the different software components in the autonomous systems. Uh, some these are some of the names that they are called uh, with some of the guys where we work with, but um, there's not exactly a, an industry standard for this. It is starting to come together, but uh, sometimes it can be a challenge. Uh, then about the applications, uh, there is um, a lot of different steps that we need to go through to actually go driving. This was all the, the planning phase that I showed before in the middle. This is just uh, an example of what that could look like. Uh, let me just see if I can minimize this so I can actually see my own screen here. Oh, nope. Um, so this is an example of, uh, of some of the different steps that we have to go through. Uh, we have to describe the project, the conditions that we're driving under. We have to do various technical applications and, uh, and get both the vehicle approved and get the autonomous system approved. And we have to do uh, an in-depth risk assessment uh, for some of the places that we go driving. So uh, all of this has to be uh, put together. It has to be validated with not only the authorities uh, in Denmark, for example, it also has to be validated with a third party assessor. So um, we are uh, we really uh, have gone through all the different steps and all the different tests. And of course, now the, the different vehicle vendors will take on more of this complexity. The, the guys who develop the autonomous systems will start to align around standards and, we, and some of these systems will come pre-approved in different ways. But uh, there's a lot of, uh, of work to be done here still and uh, a lot of alignment to be done. And uh, yeah, some examples of how things are, are changing as well. You're not supposed to read every detail on the right side. Uh, the writing is too small for that. It's just an example of how we work. So this is a, a diagram that we use internally to keep track of some of the SOPs, as we call them, the standard operating procedures that we use in our daily operation. 
So to get approved, we uh, we need to describe uh, every detail of what we do. So just cleaning a light out, for example, it's we need to make sure that we can document that it's been done the right way and that it's been done frequently enough that it doesn't become a safety issue that the lidar is covered in something. Uh, this is how the authorities challenge us uh, to to make this kind of uh, detailed documentation. So this is where things start to look a little bit more like aviation than it looks like uh, you know, a normal bus driver uh, taking a vehicle on the route. So in some countries that are not as, as strict as this yet, that's the they are in, in Denmark, and we're we're seeing some of this come up in Norway as well. But um, I, I'm pretty sure it will be over time, especially when we actually have to take the safety driver out. The authorities will will start to ask these kind of questions, hopefully, at least. And then, of course, once we have the SOPs updated, we need to uh, train and, and retrain our safety drivers to uh, and operators to uh, to do these things. Just another example, um, incidents Incidents happen when you go driving. It's not a matter of uh, if it will happen or not. It's a matter of uh, when and how many times it's going to happen. So here's just one part of the incident process that we have. I think there's at least three other more slides before this process is done. But of course, uh, we've driven many kilometers, many hours. We've seen uh, quite a few incidents and we, uh, we have a very strict process for how to handle that uh, from here in the beginning to to just make sure that uh, everyone is safe to into the next steps, contacting the authorities, expecting data, doing uh, various incidents reports and, and, and summaries uh, and uh, troubleshooting and, and making sure that we uh, we learn everything we can from an incident to make sure that it doesn't happen in the, in the same way again and that we improve the software, we improve the hardware, we improve the training of the safety drivers as well. So uh, yeah, long and complicated process that has really been, been built out over time. So uh, I showed before a, um, a box where we uh, we do the supervision for a route. So recently uh, we, we made this slide to kind of summarize what is it that they actually do in supervision. So uh, these are all the different activities that they do. When we work with a, a vehicle vendor uh, in, the, in the top right corner, we uh, we find issues that we, uh, we send back to our uh, vehicle vendors in different ways. Uh, we also find things that are uh, kind of missing maybe from their software in different ways. We, we work closely together to improve the product. So we, we log some feature requests in different ways. And then we, uh, in the operational reporting, we summarize the data that we collect from the vehicles in different ways to, to have in status meetings with our customer, with the vehicle vendor, with the authorities on a regular basis. As mentioned, incident management is an is a important thing to have uh, be in control of. We need to do maintenance on the vehicles. We need to log the the breakdowns and the spare parts that need to be changed. And we need to log when we actually make changes to the vehicles, so we can stay compliant. And there's just the, the monitoring, uh, real-time monitoring of the vehicles. We're of course practicing that more and more uh, towards taking the safety driver out so we can really understand what's going on in the route in real time uh, in the vehicle. And um, we, still, we, are, we, we still are operating a, a bus line when we go driving with autonomous vehicles. So we have to do route scheduling. Uh, follow a timetable, uh, make sure passengers know about cancellations and updates. We have to uh, make sure that our safety drivers are on, on shift in the right way. And then there's just a lot of, uh, yeah, day-to-day -day troubleshooting of, of new things. I usually kind of joke that we're better at, at breaking the product of our uh, vehicle vendors than, uh, than anyone else uh, because we, we do different things with it than could have been uh, anticipated. So uh, if the troubleshooting fails and you can see the line going up to the uh, to actually issue logging and 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 yeah, requiring a fix somehow from the vehicle vendor. Uh, to support all this, we built uh, our own platform. Uh, we, um, we kind of built all the glue that uh, is needed in between us and the vehicle vendor and, the, uh, and our customers and uh, the routes that we go driving on. So here at the bottom level, we, we get data from the vehicles. So it could be Navia vehicles, Sensible 4 vehicles. It would be the rigid check drones that we're flying with. And we put all that data on our platform and then we serve it in different ways up here at the top in the supervision portal where we monitor in real time in an operator app uh, in the operational dashboards where we summarize week by week. Uh, and then we also serve APIs or other integrations towards uh, our customers. And uh, you can find us in uh, follow.letsholo.com as a public website. You can go there and see our vehicles in real time or you can find us in the, uh, in the app store as well. So this is what it looks like when we uh, when we uh, have a uh, where we collect data in the vehicle. So what we want to do is that we, uh, besides the data that we get from the actual vehicle itself, we want to be able to collect data manually as well. So this is what we do with what we call the operator app in the vehicle. So uh, our safety driver can register all kinds of things. Uh, one thing being passengers, because we don't have automated passenger counting at the moment, unfortunately. So we need to to count that in different categories. And then here in the middle, we 
we count all kinds of uh, different issues that the vehicle might not be able to register. So accidents uh, that didn't really happen maybe, or people falling over in the vehicle or other little things that our customer might want to, uh, to see and, and keep track of. And then we spend a lot of time on, uh, on figuring out how to, to correctly summarize the uptime of a route, but I'll get back to And then, uh, yeah, summarizing it all in uh, different dashboards. This is the Nohan route in Copenhagen. Um, on, a, on a route on the top right corner, we want to see uh, on, on which corners that we might not be behaving in the right way, where we are switching, for example, from uh, autonomous mode to manual mode. So uh, yeah, it's uh, different ways of summarizing the data. When are the passengers in the vehicle going in and out? Uh, let's us uh, try and, and schedule in the right way and uh, make sure we follow the, the time plan. But uh, this is constantly evolving, uh, the data that we collect and the way we summarize it with our customers. Um, kind of the story behind a lot of the data is that uh, we're kind of sitting in the middle as in this, uh, yeah, uh, five way, at least the way I sum it up the, so far in a five way uh, kind of data collection, uh, data information circle here that uh, of course we get the, the data from the vehicle, just like the, the vehicle vendor does. We collect data as you just saw in the operator app. And then we also combine the data in different ways with weather data, traffic data, and other data that we can get our hands on. Uh, we also know what we have, uh, uh, how the route is mapped and, and what the road rules are. and uh, and, and what the authorities have been asking us to do. And we can kind of compare that with the data that we're collecting to, to gain some kind of new uh, insights in different ways. And this is where we're in a little bit of a unique position that uh, even the authorities, our vehicle vendors, or our customers, like a, a public transport authority, doesn't have this uh, full overview. They have other parts of the data that we don't have. But in terms of, of optimizing the operation, we, we sit kind of here in the middle. And uh, what we are focused on, uh, more than anything else at the moment is uh, keeping uptime and keeping the, the uh, route uh, operational as much as possible, really um, getting it to a point where it feels like a normal uh, bus line and uh, you kind of forget that it's autonomous. Uh, so this is uh, one way to keep track of it on some different routes uh, going back uh, some months here. Uh, so either there's an improvement or there's a, a step back and there's many different reasons for when we take a step back, as you can see that we do have that. Uh, it could be uh, hardware, it could be software, it could be weather, it could be shifts, it could be coronavirus, uh, many different uh, reasons for us uh, breaking down in different ways. But we always want to be able to give a clear picture of where we are and where we are making improvements and where we might be taking some steps back. And then we also want to know what the reason is. Uh, I blurred out some of the, the reasons here because uh, it requires a little bit more explanation than we have what we have time for today. I left the GNSS network in here, as you can see, the the kind of greenish color here for the GNSS network is not a big issue. Uh, in October of 2020 for one route, it was a very small uh, reason for, for breaking down. Then in November, it was a slightly bigger reason. And then, you know, it lets us know that this is something that we need to investigate and we need to, to troubleshoot in different ways. We need to find ways around uh, that problem. So a very data-driven way of, of doing things. And this is uh, kind of a new iteration of that as well. I've left the categories out here because uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit more sensitive, but as you can see, uh, uh, we're down now to summarizing in uh, by the minute and the hour uh, for the different uh, breakdown categories. And this is, uh, is really where we want to be. So we make sure that we always focus on the biggest problem that we are facing. Uh, where we want to go uh, is, is where we constantly uh, increase the kind of the complexity that we're operating with. As uh, Asad mentioned, taking the safety driver off, out, of course, is a, is a really uh, big thing uh, for us, but also driving in different environments and and constantly uh, ramping up as well. What usually happens when you want to take the safety driver out is that you have to operate at a lower speed or in a, in a more limited environment. Uh, those are the, the trade-offs that you have to make. Uh, and, uh, and we want to find the, the good compromise between the two and always learn new things and, and make progress. So we've done the demos, we've done uh, indoor even, uh, we are uh, done on-road uh, fixed route. We're still doing that but we want to move towards this um, on the road, uh, on demand, on a fixed route where we can, we can service different people like a, uh, a bus line that can skip uh, different uh, bus stops, for example. And we want to, of course, go to uh, on demand on a dynamic route where we operate like a taxi or, or something like that. We operate point to point uh, and you basically order a vehicle to where you are. Uh, so that's going to be, uh, be very exciting. Uh, yeah, and the same in the air. Uh, B-Veloz is a beyond visual line of sight. So we've done that already. 
And now we are looking to find uh, beyond visual line of sight flights where uh, the drone flies from A to B in an open airspace uh, with, with other aviation, which is a, a really challenging uh, thing to do. Uh, our future role in this whole landscape um, is evolving, I would say. Um, at the moment, we see uh, in some places that the, uh, the vehicle vendors that we're working with are, are building the vehicle and uh, building various parts of the, uh, the components that go into a system, the software components up in the top, uh, top row here. We kind of expect and what we're seeing now is they're, uh, they're focusing in, uh, there's a lot of specialization going on. So uh, in the future, they will probably be building on more vehicle platforms and, and focusing more on the software like we see in the project with Toyota and Sensible 4. Uh, and we might even see some, some even finer specialization that people who, uh, companies today that deliver the whole autonomous system might uh, only deliver certain software components into the system in the future. Um, and uh, yeah, and the, the bottom left corner for the orange box here is that we are seeing now some of the, the existing OEMs, the existing uh, uh, automotive producers are starting to create autonomous ready vehicles as well. So in this space, what we might hope to be is a, kind of an integrator of all these different components that we, we will talk to a customer somewhere, uh, airport, harbor, hospital, public transport authority, uh, whatever it might be. And they will tell us we want to operate this route at this frequency with this many passengers and so on. And we will say, okay, well, we, uh, we want to, to take this hardware platform. We want to take this software platform. We want to combine them. We want to configure it in different ways. We might want to add different kinds of software or sensors to it to fulfill the requirements. And, and we're kind of the ones that, uh, that put all these different components together and, and, and set it up in the way that works for this route for this uh, customer. That's kind of what I brought. I'm a little surprised that I'm actually a little bit ahead of time. 